Hello, my name is Kevin from Armitage Candle Company, and today we're going to talk about candle testing, specifically seven tips to help you test more efficiently, more quickly, just altogether better. Because testing, while critical, it takes a long time. And if you're going to do this right, you need to test right. My first tip today is you need to simplify. What do I mean by simplify? Well, think about your candle, all the different factors inside. You've got your wicks, you've got your wax, you've got your container, or maybe it's a pillar or a votive, the candle type. And all of these things are going to play into how the candle burns and how effective it is and exactly how it behaves under certain conditions. Well, professional candle makers are testing every single candle they make. And, and the truth is you can't send a candle out on the market that you haven't tested and made sure it's safe and burns well and maybe smells great. Usually that's something you want. So the purpose of simplifying is to reduce the amount of testing you have to do. In order to simplify, you really need to do two things. You need to determine one, what wax blend are you going to use in this candle? And I realize that can be a little bit scary because sometimes people are like, I don't know if I want to do soy or paraffin or some sort of combination or a pre-blend that's already on the market. And, and my advice to you is this, just relax. <laughs> it's okay. Whatever you pick is going to be a fine starting point and you can pivot later. But in order to simplify what's to come, you just got to make that decision. The second thing you need to decide is what kind of candle you're going to make. Is it a container candle? Is it a pillar or a votive? Is it decorative? The idea there is that if you're gonna do a container candle specifically, you need to decide what container you're gonna use and just kind of stick with it, at least at first, because every candle burns differently and the container plays a huge role in this. If you switch containers, let's say that you start with like a tin and then you wanna switch over to a jar all the testing that led into the tin doesn't apply to the jar. So a wick that might work in this eight ounce tin might not work in an eight ounce jar. So I suggest that you choose a wax blend and a container. Carlos, your constants, that's your foundation. Everything else will build on top of that. My second tip for you is label and record everything. I want you to be as meticulous as a serial killer with this because it's so important not to rely on your own memory. Believe me, I barely remember what I had for breakfast today. The truth is the better you take notes, the better that you label things and the better you stay organized through all of it, the easier it's going to be to re reference those things and understand exactly what's happening in all of your tests. A quick little hack for you, use painter's tape to label your containers. It comes off easy. You can label right over the top of it. It's better than using those white little Avery stickers that go over the top and they just don't peel off very well. So what should you record? I would suggest record everything that you possibly think could be useful. When I start a test, I want to know the ambient air temperatures. I want to know what wax I'm using. Obviously you should know that. I need to know the date. I need to know how long it cured. I want to know how long I'm gonna burn it for, typically four hours. The point is, whatever you record will help be a tool for you to make decisions down the road. If you're just shooting in the dark with all this information, information overload, or you're trying to go off a of memory, it could take you a long time to get on the right track, or you might just be lost in the dark for a while. So my suggestion to you, be meticulous, be detailed, make it easy for you to find out what happened when you burn these candles. My third tip for you is a little less common. Uh, it's something that I think a lot of professionals are doing and that is finding the baseline wick for your naked wax. What I mean by that is in your chosen container, your two constants, your wax blend and your container, those two things, there's gonna be a wick that burns well in that wax container combination. And I want you to find that before you add any fragrance, before you add any color, because that baseline wick will reveal the entire impact of almost every additive that you build on top. So the idea, the theory, is that you work through kind of a pipeline, right? You start with your two constants, wax, container. Then you find the wick that works for that. Okay, let's say it's a CD10. Your CD10 works well in that bare wax. 
great. Passes the burn test, passes, well, you aren't going to smell it. There's no fragrance, but and then you add your fragrance oil and it's too big or it's too small. The baseline wick tells you, well, I know a CD10 works in this. And when I added the fragrance, it screwed everything up. So the culprit is the fragrance. So knowing your baseline wick will help you identify exactly how everything acts in your candle so you can make adjustments accordingly without trying to shoot in the dark. That tip feeds into my next one, number four, which is retest new lots of wax when you get them to make sure that they haven't changed. So we're gonna assume when we make candles that this wax is constant and really that's one of the worst assumptions you can make in candle making. The baseline wick will tell you if that new lot of wax has changed. And the lot of wax is just, it came from a different section, storage, location, maybe even a different supplier altogether for that wax type. And the variances in wax additives and transportation and method of manufacturing can change the impact. It might fall within the quality control standards, but it could be a little different. And so the idea is when you get a new lot of wax, put your baseline wick in it, run it through a test, several tests, make sure it's still the right wick size because if your wax changes dramatically, that can impact everything downstream of your candles. And the last thing you want is your customers coming back to you saying, hey, your candle really didn't work at all. It was smoky, it tunneled, it did something unexpected you don't want them to be notifying you. You want to know ahead of time so you can make adjustments in your process. My fifth piece of advice to you is test every single fragrance oil. So a lot of people think, oh, well, I figured out the wick for this container and this wax, but they aren't thinking about the impact of every fragrance oil. Now they're all different. And that means that they may change the characteristics of your burn in dramatic ways. So it's important that no matter how badly you want to or how bad you think, oh, it'll just work out, that you do test every fragrance oil. Not just different types, but different amounts too because the, the whole thing is a system. Everything added impacts everything added. Make sure for every fragrance oil, there's another test to back it up that, hey, this candle meets my standards. Tip number six is that no matter what kind of testing you do, always include the industry standard test. Now, what am I talking about? If you haven't heard about it, ASTM F2417 is a voluntary industry standard that describes how candles should burn. And it lays out all these procedures and kind of these failure criteria for when you burn a candle, like it should do these things and it shouldn't do these other things. And now the way they describe the procedures, the way that they describe the fail criteria, we, we can kind of live with some of that. And it's not necessarily realistic for how a customer is gonna burn the candle. For instance, a simple example is it requires you to trim your wick every time. And like, we know that, but like who's, who's really doing that, right? But here's why it's important that you always include that industry standard test, even if you do other testing as well. Because if something happens, I hope it doesn't. If something happens and a product liability claim is brought against you, for instance, someone burned a candle and it started something on fire or it burned them. The industry standard test is what the court will probably expect you followed when developing your candle. Like think about all the people that are buying candle kits. Hey, I made a candle and they just sell it. They didn't really test it. It's dangerous, it's scary. If you've been around a while, then you know that your candle behaves in kind of unexpected ways. Even the kits, as good as they are, they aren't always perfectly sized. And you don't want to give anything to a customer that's not safe or doesn't perform well. So that's why I recommend that you always include that industry standard test. Okay, my last piece of advice today is a series of small little candle hacks to kind of help you find your way through the dark when you're just starting out or you're moving into a new area and you have no idea what wick to start with. And before I get into it, I want to make sure I mention that these are not a substitute for the industry standard test. These are simply ways to kind of increase your problem solving at the front end so that you can pour a full candle and burn it start to finish as you want. So the first mini hack today is to only pour half of a candle. Why half a candle? Well, two reasons. One, it only costs half the materials and two, 
The second half of a candle is actually the hardest part of the candle to burn. If you've watched the melt pool video, and go check that out here if you haven't, we talk about how the candle actually heats up in the second half of the burn. And so the risk of failing the test for kind of container temperature really increases. So if you can pass the test in the second half of a candle, it's a good starting point. That wick is probably something you should pay attention to. And so if I pour half a candle and I pass that test all the way down, I'll pour a full candle of the same wick and see how it goes. Now the second little hack kind of plays into that. If you're burning through a candle and it's not going well, you can just replace the wick. And it's a fairly simple procedure. It does take an Apple core device, Apple core, how do you even say that? And it involves pulling a plug out, pulling the old wick out, putting the new wick in, putting the plug back in, heat gun. Uh, go check out that video if you want to know how to do that. Now that's kind of like, as you're going, uh, this failed, I'm gonna wick down or I'm gonna wick up. Just pull the wick out, put a new wick in, burn away. And the third hack is kind of like that, uh, but simpler, you don't need an apple coring device. And the third hack is this, pour your candle, no wick, totally wickless. And when it's cured and you're ready to test, use a skewer or a chopstick, poke a hole or a couple holes if you're gonna do multiple wicks and thread your wick down there and burn away. You don't need to heat gun it, the little bit of cavity between the wick and the wax, not a big deal. And that's just another way to kind of quickly switch between wicks as you're going. A couple things to keep in mind with that is a wick tab does provide structural support, not a big deal until you're near the bottom and most of the wax is a melt pool. If you don't have a wick tab, if you do a wick list and you insert the wick, it could tip over into the wax because nothing's holding it up. The other thing is that soy gets really soft and mushy near the bottom and you could run into problems with the wick tipping over there as well. And if you really need to switch the wick or you want to finish the candle, you can just perform the wick replacement procedure with a wick tab done. And so those are my tips. I hope that they increase your candle testing speed. I hope they go, you are so fast. Thousands of candles. I hope that they are passing every test. Every single test. The test of time. Anyways, thank you for watching. Check out the blog. There's a much more detailed post on the website about all this stuff. Sign up for the newsletter. Like, subscribe, thumbs up, send a message, send me an email, send me a DM, whatever you want to do. Peace out. Thanks for watching. Oh,